Good morning, Shaw's Creek. What a blessing it is to see all of your smiling faces. Take your bulletin, stand up, and on the back, the Psalm 113 chorus. Let's all sing it together. Here we go. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, praise His name, praise His glorious name. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, we will praise His name, praise His glorious name for the Lord is high. for the opening prayer. Well, welcome to Shaw's Creek Baptist Church. My name is Colin Taranzini. I'm the pastor here. And we just want to say thank you for choosing to worship together as a faith family. What a wonderful day in God's house. It has already been and it will continue to be. And so why don't we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we come to you right now with confidence and expectation that you do a work that only you can do. And Father, we are broken, imperfect people, and we come in the presence of an unbreakable, unshakable King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And so, Father, as we meet today, I pray that you would bring us encouragement, that you would bring conviction, that we would love our neighbors well, that we would love one another well, and that we would love you well. Father, we're just so grateful, and we're humbled, and we praise you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
Amen. What love. That was great, choir. Thank you. Okay, take your red hymnal, your church hymnal, if you can put your hands on one, and let's turn to page 340. Stand up and sing, I know whom I have believed. Sing out. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. Sing it. But I know. the second. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his broad peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he I know not when my Lord make at night or noonday fair, nor if I walk the or meet him in the sing it, but I know. Be seated. Thank you. Well, when you came in today, you should have been given a bulletin. I just want to go through a couple quick announcements with you. Starting with today is the day the Red Book Hymnal Sing. That's going to be tonight. At 6 p.m., you do not want to miss that. There's a couple churches, and uh, it's going to be a, a, a wonderful time, a time of worship. Um, so get out here, mark your calendars for that, and some, surprises. and some surprises. Well, we can't give those out until tonight. But there you go. Come out for the Red Book Hymnal Sing. Not only that, um, when you open the bulletin, you're going to see 
our Shaw's Creek Baptist Church Connect card. If you are our, a guest with us today, we just want to say how thankful we are that you would choose to worship with us. We would ask that you would fill this out and just place it in the offertory um, plate as it goes by. That way we have a record of your attendance and we can also pray for you. So go ahead and fill that out. There will be no Bible study this upcoming Tuesday. Uh, sun, uh, actually, there will be no Tuesday Bible study on June 21st. June 21st, there will be no Bible study. Um, not only that, but these altar flowers look so, so pretty. Um, they are placed there by Elizabeth Barton as well as Francis Blackwell in a loving memory of their sister, Carrie Barton, who passed away June 9th, 2021. Um, also, um, some of the ladies on this upcoming Thursday at 10 a.m., uh, Miss Jan is looking for some help to do the Operation Christmas Child, packing and doing everything. So ladies, um, see Jan. That will be Thursday at 10 a.m. One more announcement. Um, this week, we've, we've uh, you know, had some hardships. And this week, uh, the Lord saw fit to take home Miss Carolyn. And, uh, and so I just want to personally from the pulpit uh, tell Mr. Pete that we as a church family are praying and we love the whole Davis family. Um, I also want to say what, what devotion for Mr. Pete to, to be here today. Um, and so we uh, love you. We love your family. We're supporting you. And uh, we are lifting you up in prayer tomorrow at um, 1 p.m. There will be a service here for Miss Carolyn. Um, and so come out and we're going to celebrate. We are going to celebrate her new home. So with that being said, I think that's all the announcements that I have. Uh, why don't we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we come to you right now, and I pray that you would strengthen Mr. Pete and his family. I pray that you would just give them comfort and grace, that you would carry him in the moments of weakness. Father, I pray in the moments of their own weakness that they would lean on you, that they would trust in you. Father, be with us today in the week coming up as we celebrate you and your faithfulness, as we try to live on mission for Jesus. Use us, mold us, guide us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up and let's begin to worship again. Take your red hymnal again. Turn to page 362. I am thine, O Lord. say this in reading this last Sunday Carolyn and Pete Davis were standing right where he's sitting today she had not no idea Tuesday was coming and that a stroke would hit her very quickly and that Friday she would be home with him never in my life have I met a more devout Christian lady than Carolyn Davis. She loved the Lord, loved the Lord. 
And she would tell me about her Bible studies. I never went with her to First Baptist, and I never got to go, but Lula Mae Briggs, one of her Bible study teachers, every week she would call me and she'd say, Kathy, this is what we learned today. It'll draw you closer to the Lord. Read it. Draw, it'll draw you nearer. She was a dear friend that cared about my spiritual being. And that meant the world to me. Meant the world to me. And I was reading this. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. That was what Carolyn lived. She wanted to be nearer to her Lord. And today she's right at his feet. And what a blessing. What a blessing. Let's sing the last verse. There are depths of love that I cannot know Till I cross the narrow sea There are heights of joy that I may not reach Till I rest in peace with Thee Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord To the cross where Thou You may be seated. Thank you. Well, at this time, as we remain in a posture of worship, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. Uh, this is the time in our service when we take up our tithes and offerings. And we are a member-attended, supported church. And what does that mean, Colin? Well, that means that we don't have any outsider support, that there's no diocese or anything like that, that uh, your tithes and your funds go to the ministry here at Shaw's Creek Baptist Church. We are able to um, buy curriculum. We're able to do things with Operation Christmas Child. And so thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your faithfulness in giving. Uh, Steve, would you pray? Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We just thank you for that opportunity to hear the word of you. Lord, I just ask you to be with the church, be with the preachers, and bring the message. But I ask you to be with the family, Lord, they're here to us. I'm in my heart. I just want to say, just be with them, comfort them, and draw them like you did. Lord, I just ask you to be with them to the service. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of, you guessed it, James. We are going to be in James chapter 3 today, looking specifically at verses 1 through 12. I, um, I, I, I want to give just a side note. Um, talking about the book of James, there's a lot of this uh, theme of living sacrificially. There's a, there's a theme of pure religion. Not just walking, or not just talking the talk, but also walking the walk. And uh, I don't know if you saw in the bulletin a couple weeks ago, um, we were raising money for a family. A family that the Lord had placed on the leadership's heart. Um, and, uh, and so we did it for two weeks. And we were able to give them, um, I believe it was uh, a check for close to eleven or twelve hundred dollars, and that was above tithes. That was your offerings because you love well. And when I saw the number there and I looked at what we're going through right now, it all made sense. That Shaw's Creek Baptist Church, you love together and you love on each other well. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, James, the half-brother of Jesus who is writing a circular letter to the church that is made up of Jews and Gentiles together, whom also they are scattered at the moment due to persecution. We have been walking slowly through this book, and one of the big themes is faith, and then the next big theme that I'm understanding is a pure religion. A pure religion, one that James says is not defiled. Let us begin by reading James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts Great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? Or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Who is wise in understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Let God bless the reading of his holy, infallible word. I want to talk just for a moment, though, about something that has been known to divide churches. I want to talk for a moment on something that has been known to divide churches. Families. I want to talk for a moment on something that's been known to to sever relationships and friendships. Something that hurts. Something that makes people feel hopeless and helpless. 
makes them feel alone. That, of course, is the tongue. Did you know that your tongue is made up of eight muscles? The average tongue is four inches long from inside to tip, but the longest tongue that was ever measured was twice that length. Did you know the color of a person's tongue tells a story? The color of a person's tongue can be an indication of a serious health issue. If it's pink, it's healthy. But allergies, infections can change its color to red. A blistered tongue might be a sign of a negative reaction to certain allergy and blood pressure medications. While fungal infections can lead to white patches all over the tongue. Did you know a tongue contains anywhere from 2,000 to 10,000 taste buds? Some die off every couple of weeks and they are replaced with new ones. Justin Martyr, church father and apologist, wrote, By examining the tongue of a patient, physicians find out the diseases of the body. Philosophers find out the diseases of the mind. And Christians find out the diseases of the soul. Today, I've titled the message, Taming the Tongue. In what we just read in James' letter, we see right out of the gate a strong warning. James 3.1, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. James is speaking about the office here of teachers and says many should not hold the office of being a teacher. We see one qualification for being an overseer of the church and it's found in 1 Timothy 3. It says here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. With this great responsibility can come great consequence. James is stressing the high importance of sound teaching as well as the weight that the teachers carry as these are people of influence. But what James is not saying here is he is not saying you do not need to go fulfill the Great Commission. Right? We just read in James' letter, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers. But in in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, it says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them. So, I am not standing up here from the pulpit by any means saying that you do not need to take part in the redemptive plan that God has entrusted within us. That's not what's saying. I don't want you to leave here saying to ourselves, phew, I don't have to teach people about Jesus because James says that some of us just shouldn't be teachers. No, false. James is saying it is very important what comes out of your mouth and we will be judged based upon those words. Matthew 12, 36. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. It's also important to point out that the only reason we are talking about this today, James nails on the head. Look what he says, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Romans 3.23 is a perfect picture right here. For all have sinned. If it wasn't for our sinfulness, we wouldn't even have to gather as a faith family to talk about taming the tongue. That's our sinfulness. But he goes on understanding and pointing to the only perfect man. And his name is Jesus Christ. He is able to tame the tongue and bridle his whole body. He 
is able to. So in verse 1, we get James talking specifically to teachers. However, verses 2 through 12 says nothing anymore about teachers and is a great application for every Christ follower, every born-again believer. So this is where we will camp out for the remainder of our time. Taming the tongue is important. It's important because if you're taking notes, we see the intensity of the tongue. We see the intensity of the tongue. That's found between verses 3 and 5. James gives us two examples or two pictures here. He says first, the bit. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. A bit can be made from iron, copper, rubber, and plastic. It's about five to six inches. It goes in the mouth of the horse. This is to help with the communication between the horse and the rider. If the rider wants to stop to, or turn, all they must do is guide the bridle with the reins that is attached to the bit. A horse is anywhere from 900 to 2,000 pounds based off size and breed, and yet a five-inch piece of metal that goes in its mouth is what is used to control it. Let's look at the second example, the rudder. Ships are huge vessels, and back in the day were driven by wind and not by engines as they are today. But the direction of such mighty ships, both men and both then and now, is controlled by what? A rudder. Imagine such a little piece on this big ship, and this is the piece that makes the ship turn. The two analogies that are given from James are to, shown, are to show the power, the intensity of the tongue. James uses the two basic modes of transportation back at this time and how there is intense power behind it. One understanding that we can take away is that size does not matter in this case. The size of the tongue is disproportionate to the influence it has. I'll say that again. The size of the tongue is disproportionate to the influence it has. Taming the tongue is important also because we see the immorality of the tongue. We see the immorality of the tongue. You want to know why we see immorality when we look at the tongue, because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The tongue is a direct reflection of the heart. That is why James includes himself in this verse, in verse 2, in saying, we stumble, all fall short of God's glory. He's not writing this letter saying, hey, you guys need to do better. But he is including himself in this letter saying, we all stumble. In the Greek, this understanding stumble, though, it means to trip. It does not mean to fall down and not get back up. That would be an entirely different Word. So in the Greek here, we're talking about tripping. We're talking about stumbling. We're not talking about falling and staying down. But we stumble. All fall short of God's glory, and we're all in need of redemption. Immoral words spread, don't they? Did you know in the 90s there was a wildfire, I believe it was in New Jersey, that burnt 800 acres? 800 acres. You know what started that wildfire? A cigarette butt. Something so small. Something that that person probably did a thousand times before with no consequence. Something that was so natural to that person at that very time. And so even if you get away with it once, the everyday action can come back to have long-lasting consequences. John Piper states, a small fire can destroy an entire forest. All it takes is an uncontrolled spark. So it is with the tongue. 
A sharp word, a loose sentence, a callous aside can cause a conflagration that cannot be extinguished. Words can consume and destroy a life. Not only do immoral words spread, but also immoral words cause destruction. James is very specific about the destruction and the, de- and the source of the, dis- the destruction. The tongue that sets on fire is set on fire itself by hell. James uses the biblical term Gehenna, the background reference being to the Valley of Hinnom on the southern outskirts of Jerusalem. It served as the city dump, hence the reference to fire. All day you would go by this place and the smoke would be billowing, the heat would be hard to stand. It was a nasty, nasty place. And yet that is the wording that James chooses to describe the source of the tongue. The biggest lie that has ever been told is that childhood riddle. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Words hurt. Words hurt. Let's listen to Job on this one. Job 19.2 How long will you torment me and crush me with words? While a physical wound you can heal from, words hurt, they sting, they last a while. Let me give you a personal story about this, okay? This is a personal illustration. Not many of you know this, but maybe sometimes while you're in service, you might be dazing off. I don't think any of you would actually do that. But all of a sudden, you'll hear a quick whistle. I don't know since you've been here if you've heard of that whistle. When I say a word, I may say worship or something such as that, and you'll hear a whistle, and you may turn around and think to yourself, we need to buy a new PA system. Well, that's not the case. You see, your pastor has a partial. I have a partial. And so once in a while, I whistle when I say a word. You know how I got this partial? Well, about two years ago, I was at youth group. And that's where... Uh, the source of what happened led me to get a partial. You know how long it took to get that partial? Not very long. I went, I got, you know, it it all taken care of. I went, they ordered it. Eight weeks it was here. Bada bing, bada boom, I'm walking around with a tooth. I love it, right? It's it's wonderful. No one can tell, hopefully. Um, But I tell that story, and I stand up here to tell that story, because two years ago, I remember we were making some changes within the youth group. We wanted it to be less pizza and less games and more discipleship. I wanted those kids to learn and grow. I didn't want the students that were under my wing to have that statistic that when they get to 18 years old, they leave the church and they don't come back. And so I implemented a couple things. A couple things of less, all this other stuff, and more time studying the Word of God. And wouldn't you know it, I came in to an anonymous letter. And can I tell you that that anonymous letter lasted longer than it took the time to do my partial. I say that. The words on that hurt. It cut. And and so so I say that today, and I stand up here, one, very vulnerable, because now you know that I'm missing a tooth. Um, But also, I stand up here today to share with you that words hurt. If you think in your lifetime, I guarantee you, you can come to a point where you said, you know what? What he said cut me deep. You know what? I have thick skin, but that was way too much. The church of Jesus Christ, the bride, should be demonstrating the redemptive work. We should be building people up. We should be exhorting one another. We should be giving grace where grace is due. We should be doing all of that. And yet so many times, people leave destroyed by the words that even church members would say. Matthew 5, 21. 
You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. James takes a shift here, though. He stops with that and he begins to show a picture of animals. Wild beasts. Big, tall, strong, monstrous. For my son's birthday a couple years ago, we went to the zoo in Rhode Island. Uh, It was fairly large, full of exotic animals. You could look over and you could see different animals like elephants and giraffes, tigers, lions. You could see them all. Down here, you can go to western North Carolina and you can see the bears that are just laying about or other animals. Right? But they have been taught and they have been trained. Right? These animals that were once wild didn't seem to be that way anymore. They were trained and they were tame. Workers of the zoo can go in to offer food or to clean stalls. The lions, elephants, and giraffes that are in the world are much different than the ones at the zoo. However, James is painting a picture here to show these animals who devour, these animals that destroy, these animals that make a mess, these animals that if we were out in the wild somewhere in Africa, they would have no qualms about coming up and attacking us, killing us, and eating us. Those very animals are tamed by mankind. James goes on to say, no one has tamed the tongue. Imagine that. When you think about those two things, the tongue, the human being, you wouldn't put them up against such a crazy, monstrous animal. And yet, that is exactly what James is doing. Taming the tongue is important, lastly, because we see the inconsistency of the tongue. He ends here with a contradiction. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. There's an inconsistency that James is pointing out. He's saying, you say that you are a Christ follower, and yet this is what is coming from your mouth. There's inconsistencies in this. And James is looking back at this church and he's saying, stop with the inconsistency. He is calling for a pure and undefiled religion. And in chapter 1, James talks about being slow to speech. And so this is a common thread that's coming throughout this letter. I think about John 15, 5. I'm the vine, you are the branch. He who abides in me bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Nothing! And so where does our fruit come from? It comes from the source, the vine. And so my question to each and every one of us today is what or who is our vine? Again, and I'll say it a thousand times, if you do not profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior... I do, not, I do not for a second think that you should try to live this life as a Christian. Because that's inconsistent as well. The Bible tells us in John that someone bears no fruit if they're not attached to the vine. But for Christ followers, for the ones who've been redeemed, for the ones who've been bought again, for the ones who have uh, repented and put their faith in Jesus Christ... How is your tongue doing? Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, 
singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. When I think about John 15, 5, I think about Colossians 3, 16 and 17, living a life that would match the redemptive heart within you. You are called to be a new creation, that the old is passed away. And sometimes we like the old, and so we go back to it. And God continues having to bring us along, saying, don't go back to the old. You have the new. It's a contradiction if you talk godly while not even having God in your life. Your tongue is a mirror for your heart. And so as we close today, my question to you and a couple application points Is the fruit consistent with the root? If you are not a Christ follower, I do not expect you to bring exhortation and encouragement. If you are a true Christ follower, I don't expect you to gossip. Is the fruit consistent with the root? Secondly, a question to ask ourselves. If you are a Christ follower... Are you building bridges or are you building barriers? If you are a Christ follower, are you building bridges or are you building barriers? Question number three. Are you sharing the gospel or are you sharing the gossip? Are you sharing the gospel Or are you sharing the gossip? And then four. Are you sanctifying or are you slandering? Are you sanctifying or are you slandering? And as I come to James and he calls us to this pure religion, I go back after reading it and this is where I go to. This is where I go to. I go to James chapter 3. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. I don't want to give each and every one of you a crutch, but here's what I know. I know that you and I will stumble once in a while. That you and I will fall off the horse. That you and I will have to get back on the horse because there was only one person in this world who did not stumble and his name is King Jesus Christ. He came 2,000 years ago and he died for you. He was buried in a borrowed tomb for you and he rose on the third day. So as I stand up here and and I, I, I preach a little bit, here's what I don't want you to walk out saying. Well, I don't know anything about Jesus, but I know that I need to get my words right. No, that is not what I am saying. For a second... You cannot get your words right if you don't have the vine, which is Jesus. You need the vine, and that is Christ Jesus. Out of the the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What are we doing with our mouths? We may have sat here our entire life, and we may have, have, have... bought into this that, hey, I I associate myself with Jesus and that's enough. That's not enough. You need to have a... You need to have a right standing with God and that comes through being born again, being bought again by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says trust and believe that we need to repent of our sins, that we need to live for Christ. But here's the thing. In 2022, 501c3s are shaky. The government could start taxing us based on hateful rhetoric that they presume. Um, Gender studies, whatever, whatever it is that you want to go down the corridor of time and look at, and you could say, this is what's going to impact the church the most. This is what is going to hurt the church the most. You know what's going to hurt the church the most? Slander and gossip. 
And we get out of our way. We say we're going to build bridges with our neighbors, that we're going to love on them, that we're going to encourage them, and that we're going to uh, link arms with one another through struggles, with encouragement. Words hurt. And so when James is exhorting the readers there, I want to exhort us in saying, let's build bridges. Let's look at our hearts and let's ask those questions. Sanctification or slander? Gossip or gospel? Are we building bridges or are we building barriers? Which one is it? As Kevin comes this morning and plays a little bit, I want to take this time to be introspective. I don't want to look around the room. I don't want us to look at our neighbor. I don't want us to say, hey, that person over there is a gossip or that person over there is a gossip. I want to see what we can do within ourselves because here's the, rea- the reality. Revival will start, but it starts in our own hearts. It starts in our own lives. If you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, by no means do I expect you to have godly words of encouragement. But if you do have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this might be a time for you to say, hey, Jesus, I repent. Jesus, allow me to be better in this category. Friends and family, Jesus is the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. He died for you. He was buried in a borrowed tomb for you. And he rose on the third day for you. You might be thinking to yourself right now, well, I don't have those great words of encouragement to give people. I would ask the question, have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ isn't making bad people good. He's making dead people alive. And today may be the day where he wants you to experience that abundant life. But the Bible does say out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A great mirror for your heart is your mouth. The Bible tells us that we need to have a new heart. And that can only come through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. With every head bow and with every eye closed, I want to give just a moment. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe you're thinking to yourself, hey... What Colin said, I've been in church, I've associated myself with church. I know of Jesus, but I don't know him personally. This message for that very person that might be thinking that. Friend, family member, colleague, whatever. You cannot have the right words to say. Because you do not know Jesus. This is a great opportunity. I would ask you if you want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you would uh, understand that you are sinful. That you are in need of his redemptive work. That he died on the cross. And you want to put your faith in him today. Would you just put your hand up in the air. I'm not going to bury anyone. Or I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to burden anyone. I'm not going to embarrass anyone. But if that's you today. And you want Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've never put your faith in Jesus. Would you just slip your hand up in the air. So I can pray with you. There's going to be a time in your life. At the end of it. When you stand before the King of Kings. The, ju- the righteous judge. And he will say either, well done, thy good and faithful servant, or depart from me, for I never knew you. What will he say to you? And for the rest of us today, as we close, I pray and I long that people within our community who may not even know the Lord, they may not even know much about Shaw's Creek Baptist Church, would come to us for encouragement and help. That we would be able to build a bridge with our neighbors within our community. That they would say, hey, I know some of the people there. And let me tell you, they are authentic. They are genuine. They really believe what they say they believe. I'm including myself in this. Let us pray together. 
that God would bring about conviction. That He would use us mightily to build up the kingdom of God. Father in heaven, we come before you right now knowing that you are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. And like James tells us in James chapter 3, that there was only one person who is perfect and that is your Son. And you would send your Son to this world to live a perfect sinless life, that He would die on the cross, that He would be buried in a tomb, and three days later, in victory, death could not hold Him, hell could not keep Him, that He would rise in victory as a conqueror, and He calls broken individuals to find this unbreakable, unshakable King that we can live for, that we can worship, that we can reign with, and that we can be heirs to. Allow us to find that freedom within our hearts, and it would be a representation with our tongue. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, real quick, before we go, uh, come back tonight. We'd love to have you. We'd love to, uh, multiple choirs, multiple uh, quartets and trios and things such as that. So you don't want to miss it. 6 p.m. here at Shaw's Creek uh, Baptist Church. Um, but we love you so much. Um, my pastor, I always say this at the end, but my pastor says that the church is not the steeple, but the people. So let's go be that church. God bless.